Welcome to Behind the Curtain, Nashville's Movers, Shakers, and Tastemakers, brought to you by Cord Real Estate, your key to the heart of Nashville. I'm Steve Luther, alongside my co-host, Van Hoy. Here we peel back the layers of Nashville's vibrant scene, sitting down with the innovators, creators, and leaders who shape our city. From music to business and everything in between, we dive into the journeys that have brought them to where they are today. We're here to uncover the stories behind the success, the passion driving their pursuits, and why they've chosen Nashville as their stage. It's about the people who dream big, push boundaries, and make this city truly unique. So join us as we explore the heart and soul of Nashville through the eyes of those who know it best. Well, welcome to the show, Don Staniszewski, a seasoned leader in the logistics and transportation industry. As the president of Pillar Logistics and a pivotal figure in the National Home Delivery Association, Don has been instrumental in shaping the landscape of last mile delivery services across the United States. His expertise spans the management of complex logistics operations for furniture, appliances, and electronics, servicing major retailers nationwide. With a career rooted in operational excellence and innovative logistics solutions, Don continues to drive the industry forward, setting new standards for efficiency and customer satisfaction. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> well, I, thank I, you, Stephen. Man. I, I, I'm I telling you. That's <laughs> impressive. I wonder, what is last mile delivery services? It's, it's the final delivery to your home or office. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and it's become very trendy because now, since the pandemic, especially, right, right. everybody wants things delivered to your home. Yes, I love it. And Every it, day, yeah, that's somebody's right. showing up at my door. And in, in my industry, we actually specialize in big and bulky last oh. mile delivery because, you know, you can't have an Uber take a sofa to your house right. and you're not going to bring it in your own car. No. So it's, it's become kind of a niche industry and it's, like it's a become very refrigerator popular. or something. Refrigerators, yeah. washers, dryers yeah, yeah. And, and such. And it's, uh, uh, it's a necessary evil, and especially with appliances. I mean, people generally just don't go out shopping for appliances. You get them because your refrigerator doesn't work anymore That's right. or your washer and dryer doesn't work anymore. That's right. So it's, uh, it's become a very somewhat stable industry, frankly. Yeah. yeah. I love it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm like, if I don't have to go to another store, I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Order it. <laughs> so how did you get into logistics? Well, I, I actually graduated in psychology and I, I worked in a mental health hospital wow. for a couple of years and, um, you're going to, you're going to like define us yeah. at the end of this time here. <laughs> and, and honestly, I love that industry. It was fantastic. But the problem is you have to have a doctor degree and, you oh, know, yeah. it, 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 it's very, very difficult, very competitive. So I got, uh, I didn't have money to go to college, uh, and move on to college, uh, for a doctorate. So I actually went to work in the business industry in truck leasing and rental. And that's how I actually got into the trucking industry. My family had been in trucking for years mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it became a, a, a industry that I really liked. Uh, at the time when I got in the industry, I was one of the uh, few younger guys with a bunch of 50 year old older guys. And uh, I was one of the few that had a college education at that time. Got so it. it was kind of valuable, you know, and, and that's the way the industry started to progress. Um, so I, I really spent my whole life in the last mile and trucking logistics industry and have really enjoyed it. It's been a great career for me. Absolutely. So last mile, I, I, I guess is, is kind of a niche of, of the, the distribution industry. It is. Um, you immediately went into that or, or. I, I actually started out in like general trucking okay. and that the problem with, uh, general trucking is that, uh, it became very price sensitive and price competitive in the last mile delivery industry. There's a lot of finesse the, mm -hmm. the, the trucking is taken for granted and it became more about the customer service and the right. delivery and getting things into a home without damaging the walls or the home or, or the people getting, uh, hurt. Uh, right, right. so, so it's more of a training and sophisticated industry in that, in that regard. And, uh, uh, so I enjoyed it and, uh, it was, uh, for me, it was kind of, it certainly is a hands-on management, uh, type of industry and you don't spend the whole day behind a desk. Right. So I, I, I really enjoyed that. 
how have you seen the uh, the sector change over the years? I mean, I, I know COVID was probably a a, a big change um, or created a big change. What what's how's it evolved over the years? Without a doubt, COVID became a really big deal when COVID stri- struck and uh, companies were shutting down or or taking layoffs and such. We were busier than hell. Wow. Because people still needed their products. Right. Uh, our biggest problem was the supply chain of getting the merchandise, actually. Right. Uh, but everybody was really interested in getting things delivered to their home. And it became real popular. In fact, it's a, it's a big popular thing now. It's more and more popular for colleges. There was nobody that said, hey, I want to go in the last mile delivery industry. That was like, you know, no one really thought anything of it. Now, people really respect it. And, and it's become a really big deal. And we've grown by leaps and bounds because of it. The industry right. was, you know. Now, is it is it a, a litigious industry because you're going into so many people's homes and dealing with, you scratched my hardwood floors yeah, or whatever? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. that, that, that those are some of the biggest issues. There's, there's regulations issues, governmental regulations, employees, contractors, things like that. Uh, but you're right about damages. And the training is really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't go in and damage the merchandise, damage people's homes. You know, they pay $75, $100 for delivery, and then you get a $40,000 claim. Right. Uh, so it's become very sensitive that way. And we spend a lot of time working on training and doing things right. Uh, that's why there's not companies that come and go in this industry. And a lot of larger, huge companies have uh, previously shied away from this because the lawsuits can right. be intent, uh, you know, intense. And uh, um, so that's something that uh, is a big liability in this industry that we have to watch out for. And and we do, you know, sure. uh, so that's why, that's why we're good at it. Do the delivery people also assemble furniture they do. and things like that? They do. But see, they, now this is the, the, the problem with the industry. Yeah. You just can't take, someone like you or I and say, look, go into a truck and now deliver this refrigerator into uh, Steve's home. That's right. a big problem. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> because you know, you have to navigate and get it in the home. You also have to install it. Right. And after you install it, there's things like water leaks that become really, yeah. really uh, big issues and big risky liability issues. Um, so we spend a lot of time on training and development of people. Uh, especially the delivery teams mm. and the delivery teams, we have a lot of respect for, uh, they're, they're just not truck drivers, right? You know, right. they are, they are the face they're out on their own and very autonomous. Uh, so we have, we put a lot of, uh, a lot of faith and trust into them and, uh, and they do a good job and, you know, so, uh, uh, but it's something that's a, a necessary evil. You just can't sure. send anybody into a home. Right. Now, you, you said you moved here from uh, Chicago about nine years ago. What brought you to Nashville? Well, I actually moved from Chicago to Sacramento okay. originally. I, I was 14 years in Sacramento. He saw the light <laughs> like everybody else is. He's like, oh, I got to go there. Although I do miss the weather in Sacramento. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, what happened was uh, um, our main office was here, and uh, most of our operations were out west. Uh, so I just stayed out West and, and, uh, uh, remained there when I went to work for this, uh, uh, well, when I took over this company and, uh, um, so I wanted to wait until my kids graduated from college. And after that, uh, my wife and I moved here to Nashville about nine years ago. Very cool. Uh, so, yeah. Well, and we're quite the trekking hub here. Not that it matters, I guess, for <laughs> last mile delivery. Yeah. Last miles everywhere. That's last miles everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Yes. <laughs> so was it more of a, a personal decision to come or, or was it, well, I really needed transition to. No, I was, or... I was traveling back and forth from Sacramento to Nashville because our main office was, was here. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time I was in charge of operations. So I spent a lot of time out in the field, but also coming to our main office quite a bit. And uh, as things developed and grew and grew and grew, uh, I was coming here more and more. So finally I had to make the decision to just move here. Right. And, uh, at the time we were previously discussing before this, uh, uh, I had a, another partner who passed away from COVID. Uh, so I had mm. to be here and right. uh, got totally immersed in the business. So. 
Now, you also uh, sort of helped launch the uh, National Home Delivery Association. Talk to us a little bit about that. How did that come about? You know, what's what's your role with with them? You know, what what is what is the purpose of that organization? The National Home Delivery Association was actually a group of us friendly competitors. Uh -huh. uh, I myself and my partner had invited a bunch of our competitors here to Nashville. Uh, we were ex actually had a, a meeting at the Opryland Hotel, a three day meeting. So we invited the competitors, we had lawyers, we had insurance people, industry professionals talking about the state of the industry and what we needed to do to deal with some of the issues that were coming up and, and trying to resolve them. Uh, out of that, we decided, man, this, this is a pretty good thing. We need to continue this. So I said, well, let's start an association. So we formed a nonprofit association with these companies and it's just grown and grown and grown to where it's become the, uh, the face of the last mile industry. Uh, we call it the, uh, the uh, voice of the last mile industry. There was no such industry in the past. There were these trucking associations, but none of them dealt with the complexity of last mile delivery. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, so this association grew from 11 people to where, you know, now we have uh, uh, annual forums and, and uh, meetings and such where, you know, we have over 200 companies attend and That's uh, great. Uh, it's actually the, uh, uh, all the uh, significant and the large last mile delivery companies across the nation mm. belong to this industry. Very cool. Yeah. Now is, is there like a, a particular area of the country where a lot of these, these companies exist or I, I, is, it's interesting that, you know, such a, a large thing like this would, would be in Nashville. Um, I mean, I get Nashville's a transportation hub to some extent, but, um, but it, it is, does this tend to like, are there are companies typically in one particular city or area or not really all over? Well, I, I would say though, that a lot of last mile delivery companies are really centered around large metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, in Nashville, you know, there's a lot of trucks every day that deliver, uh, to people's homes and offices. Uh, but there's also the rural factor as well, you know, going out in the boondocks, the, the uh, delivery um, frequency is not as great, but it's still a, a necessary evil that they need to get their stuff because you can't bring it home in your car. Right. And, uh, right. But they're all over the country. And what's become very popular just lately has been a lot of consolidations. Large companies see this as a vital link that they need to be in this industry. They've been buying up a lot of these smaller companies and such. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but they're all national. A lot of them are national footprint. My company is based in Nashville, but we're all over the country. We're, we're in cool. a lot of big metro areas where right. we deliver for companies like Ashley Furniture, Restoration Hardware, Best Buy, Costco, and uh, Home Depot, things like that. Mm -hmm. And the stuff you deliver, you're, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to have a drone delivery. No, it won't be soon. You'll see a drone carrying a refrigerator <laughs> over your home. So, <laughs> so but no, no. It. So. <laughs> um, what kinds of, of change do you see coming for the industry? Um, you know, I'm sure there's probably some environmental things that come up. There is, there is, there's, there's been a lot of environmental things. It's been a lot of, uh, technological advances, mm -hmm. especially when you deal with things like, uh, AI and routing, uh, you know, what's traffic patterns are, you know, what's the optimal way to deliver within time, within all these variables, size of the merchandise, time to deliver area and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's becoming more and more of a technological, uh, type of an industry. Whereas before everything was manual right. years ago. Uh, now we're relying on a lot of different things. And in fact, um, uh, in our home delivery association, we are looking at different types of technologies where perhaps, uh, exoskeletons or different ways of lifting 
objects and bringing them into the home with stair wow. climbers and things like that because it's still a physically demanding industry. Right. It's not a it's not an old guy's game. Right. You know, you, people don't deliver in their sixties and seventies. Right. Anymore. Right. Uh, so we're finding trying to find easier ways to be able to to accomplish that and still manage to get things into home properly. That's a wow exoskeleton. Well, have you ever seen? <laughs> I'm like, whoa! You've seen the movie like yeah. Alien? Yeah. 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 Ripley was using an exoskeleton to lift things up. And I, I think the same, someday, someday soon, yeah. we'll be seeing a similar thing in the last mile delivering it, coming into your home. We need to get one of those for staging, man. I love it. <laughs> you can start lifting yeah, stuff. Yeah, that and an avatar. <laughs> Sign me up. I'm just imagining you walking around the house yeah. in an exoskeleton. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I like it. But don't write off those 60-year-olds because I'm telling you when I had a piano <laughs> delivered and there was a crew. And the young guys are like, yeah, we can't figure it out. We're going to have to send it back. And the 60 some year old guy is like, guys, here. And he's just started. Sure enough, he got it right up. Oh, the piano is one of you the know. most difficult things to deliver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it's bulky. It's, you know, yeah. fragile. Right. Really, That's really, right. You know? So, yes. <laughs> got to love it. Do you think, uh, is, is training getting more complicated? Like, I, I would imagine, like, uh, you know, some refrigerators now are, pretty technical they've got all these you know bells and whistles yeah they do, can you, even you order to, your groceries for you yeah they do like do you guys have to do all that kind of a setup? we do wow we do and setting up tvs and installing tvs right and setting them up you know it's not you just don't turn it on anymore you yeah know? it has to be set up but yes it is very technical uh but you know another part that's become very very big deal is the customer service aspect mm. so you take your general you know your normal a driver and helper and try to get them to deal with my wife your grandmother <laughs> you sure, know and, sure. and, and have a smile on their face right and that's a real challenge as well right. because people really are sensitive to that yeah right? uh, so that's a part of the training that we do as long with the technical aspect of how to install and hook up and assemble things that's good um how do you stay ahead with, with, you know, some of these, these technological advancements that are coming? Is it, you know, like what, what, what do you do to, to stay on the, on the front end of all this stuff? You, you have to, you have to stay relevant and you don't necessarily want to be the first one to come right. up with some new technological advancement because it's very difficult, but you don't want to be the last one either. Mm. And so, you know, through our association, mm -hmm. we uh, communicate with all of our competitors, what's going on, what are new developments and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's how we do it mostly. Um, you know, there, there's, there's not a lot of magic in this industry. It mostly has to do with the management and the people and how you manage things. Mm -hmm. um, there's no secret sauce. Mm -hmm. Everybody is kind of doing the same thing. Right. Yeah. So, well, with your trade organization, do you do much lobbying and that sort of thing? We, we do. Yes, we do. We, we do some of that. There's a lot of regulations, particularly in California, that have mm -hmm. become real cumbersome and such that we're trying to work through. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's become a very big issue. Right. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of it has to do, deal with politics and who is in office, uh, you know, who's the political people in California or, right. or the country. And Do you love that side of things? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, we, we say there's a softball for you. We, we say that, uh, you know, I know too much about legal issues right. and lawsuits. And generally, the people that are, that are the experts at it have had a lot of legal issues right, and lawsuits right, right. and and so i have too much experience in that they've either had to pay the bill or they got paid by the bill yes, yes. So, yes. so yeah it's become very litigious industry as well gotcha gotcha what, what kind of things have you had to put in place to um sort of manage this customer experience customer satisfaction thing like are, are you, you have you guys implemented you know, some kind of systems or like what, how do you manage that? Absolutely. You know, every delivery that we do gets a survey, you get surveys, you get a call or whatever. Right. Right. And these customer scores and NPS scores are a big, big deal. Mm. And that's how we're rated. Like I said earlier, 
the trucking is a necessary evil and it's taken for granted. Mm -hmm. It's the customer service and, and getting it into the home and the installation is the customer satisfied. So you yeah. saying I need to fill out the form. I need to, <laughs> I need to give my star rating. You don't even fill it out. We call you. Oh, wow. Yeah, because you it, heard it, it here, people <laughs> answer the phone. That's right. That's right. And you know, now everything is texting right. and so on and so forth. And you want to know where your delivery oh, is true. at. Yeah. So you don't yeah. have to stay home all day. So it's become more and more sophisticated in right. that regard. Yeah. I appreciate that when they ask my opinion through text. They do. So, yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. That's good. What's been kind of the general consensus for, for some of the uh, sustainability stuff moving to, you know, some kind of alternate vehicle or, you know, those kinds of things. Well, we're, we're, we're really spending a lot of time with electric trucks mm -hmm. and it's very cumbersome and it's not easy because, uh, uh, when we have a location where let's say we're running a hundred trucks out of a location, the electricity that's needed to recharge up these trucks oh, wow. is like powering a skyscraper. Wow. And, and so we're trying to work with utilities. It's not done yet. And there's a lot of issues with that and, and the range on trucks, you know, uh, you can't load it up with huge, huge batteries because we need payload, right. weight, you know, right. uh, so, so we're working on the, the infrastructure right now is the biggest issue. So are you friends with Elon? Yeah, I actually own a Tesla. Hey, I'm hey. very familiar. With it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, but it's it's uh, it's an interesting transition, and uh, I know California is really pushing, pushing, pushing. Right, they and are. There's a lot of issues with that that we're trying to work through, um, and you know now it seems like hydrogen is coming back. Mm -hmm. Is it maybe, really? Maybe an issue. Maybe a popular uh, transition type of a. Uh, um, engine wow. that, that may work uh because the infrastructure is not ready to support electric trucks right yet. what was the guy's name in texas uh, uh i think it was t boone pickens yeah, yeah that's, that's right, right. Oh, that's right. pushing that's natural right. gas that's right yeah and and somehow the electricity thing just won over yeah uh and the hydrogen and was pushed aside but now you know with people getting cars that are electric and trucks getting electric the infrastructure is really struggling and uh they don't all hit, they don't have it sorted out yet we need a little bit of everything yeah, we do we there do yeah now elon's talked a lot about the self-driving trucks and and you know some of the tech around that, that. freaks me out <laughs> I, but like i mean i guess i guess so you don't have like the uh the rest requirements. I don't know. I'm like, no, that's a good, that's a very good point is that, and, and that where that will come into play mostly is on over the road trucks that are on the highways because they know what in. we have trains for. Well, that's what, <laughs> I mean, and that's what, that's what a truck becomes right. a train of trucks all following each other. When you drive down the road and you see all these Walmart vehicles going back yeah. and forth, that could be a big train of trucks all going together. And I think that that the autonomous vehicle thing might come from there. They call it platooning mm. where there's one guy in front and he's got a bunch of trucks behind them that are automated. I mean, if they had their own lane, I'd be okay with that. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, what, what's very intriguing is my Tesla has autopilot. Oh, okay. And it is amazingly good. Really? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you know, I don't think we're going to see automated trucks in neighborhoods uh, per se yet because they still need a driver and helper in there to deliver the stuff. Right. You guys uh, might unload right. the truck when it gets there. Right. Right. But they do have trucks now that are going dock to dock. Uh, for instance, there's a, an experiment going on where uh, they're going from Oklahoma City to Dallas each day with no driver in it. No way. It goes drive to dock to dock and it backs up and, and so on and so forth. That's happening now. That's happening today. It's happening in Arizona. Uh, I got to well. Google this. I've never, I did not know that people, people have no idea. <laughs> so, and it's on the actual road. It is. Well, Elon's got like a, a robot now that's pretty far along. That's doing like factory well, yeah, work. Yeah, but that's like on some factory in California or Texas or somewhere. I, I think he's got out on the actual road. Hundreds of of robots doing work in the Tesla oh, factory. Sounds now. like a Will Smith movie to me. <laughs> One of my favorite stories is there's a water uh, uh, plant in Salt Lake City. Okay, it's fully automated. Mm. They have a maintenance staff of six or seven people and they have no 
reason to turn the lights on. So it's always in darkness. They, oh, they don't need lights. Crazy. <laughs> They're saving electricity. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so let's blow my mind. Let's let's turn this personal a little bit. So Oh, the Oprah you, moment, huh? We're gonna have an Oprah moment. Yeah, Oprah. We're gonna get yeah. serious. A little tear. So talk just about Iron Man. What got you into uh doing the, the, That's the whole right. Iron Man thing? Well, aren't you, know, you like a double Iron Man? Yes, I am, actually. And uh, I had been a runner all my life. You know, I've been kind of. What were you running from? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'd, I'd always been in pretty good shape and such. So, um, And I don't know why, hmm. but, you know, when I got in, when I lived in California, people were doing triathlons all over the place. And I thought, gee, I'd like to try one. And I did a small triathlon. I thought I was going to die. Huh. And I thought, especially the swimming part of it. And I, th- I kept thinking about it. I said, man, I, you know, I, I got pretty proficient at biking. I had always been a runner. So I took swimming lessons and, and someone convinced me, why don't you try to do an Ironman? And I thought, this is inhuman. I, you know, I was always in <laughs> awe of these people that could actually go out there for oh, you yeah. know, any 10 to 15 hours and, and such. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll try it. I just want to finish one. So I started and I found out how difficult it was <laughs> and, uh, but, and, and I enlisted the help from some friends. I got a coach uh, involved and such. And I found out that, uh, you know, there's a long ramp up, it took me nine months to ramp up, to get in shape, to do this thing. Uh, but it was more of taking it step by step by step. Mm. And, uh, I, I found out that, Hey, I actually can kind of do this stuff. And I got better and better at it. It was a slow process. Uh, but I found out that, hey, maybe I could even just finish one. Okay. And I told my wife, I said, if I finish this Ironman, it was actually in, in Houston, Texas. If I finish this Ironman, I'm going to get a tattoo. Oh, and, I and, <laughs> and so, you know, I, 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 I was ready and I did the Ironman and I learned to just take it as it comes. You know, don't go and charge into it. And, and I finished it. And so I did a second one just to prove that it wasn't a fluke. <laughs> I love it. So the question is, is did you get a tattoo? I did. And I what did. was it? There's a tattoo on my bicep. It says Iron Man on it. It says Thor. Well, there, <laughs> there's like an there's like an unwritten law that you cannot get an Iron Man tattoo unless you finish an oh, Iron Man. Oh, gotcha. So I was able to get one. The week after I finished, I got the tattoo. I love it. <laughs> Did you get like a second stripe after? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> one was enough. Like a notch in your gun or something. Have you thought about trying to do a third? No. Well, what happened after I did two Ironman triathlons, um, I started to exercise, you know, and I was in pretty good shape, but it was getting more and more difficult. And I found, I went to the doctor. I said, something's not right. It took about six months for them finally to diagnose that I had a mitral valve problem mm. and it was a congenital thing. And I had to get open heart surgery. Wow. So I had to get my mitral valve replaced. Um, I have, uh, you had a valve job, a valve job, a bovine <laughs> j- valve job. Mm. So now I'm pretty Move. close to all the cows in the yeah, area. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, every, uh, coming back from that was a real challenge. I know Steve, you've had your issues That's right. with coming back That's from right. illnesses and such, but it, it was a real challenge and I, I didn't realize it would be such a significant thing. Um, mm. uh, so I, I don't think that I'll do another Ironman. The problem with doing an Ironman is it's a long commitment. Right. And, uh, I used to get up at four 30 in the morning, every day, work out sometimes twice a day. And I was tired of being tired. Sure. Uh, so I, I, and I did that when I was what, 56 and 58. And, uh, now I'm 60, 67. So I don't, I don't think that I'll be doing any soon, but I'm doing five K's and things like that. So, well, you could sponsor it, right? Instead. Yes. Yeah. There I you could. go. Sit, right. sit in the, Sit the the tent and sponsor. That's right. There you go. <laughs> now you, you said moo. I, I did say moo. And, and, and moo. I, moo. I, thought, I thought you were going to say Stannis Muski. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's so rude. Well, I he's keep so I keep moving along with the <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Now, all all of this kind of led you into writing a book. Talk to us yes. about the book. 
Well, it, it is a it is an Oprah moment. We got a book. We got all this. <laughs> Everybody gets from, a book. Uh, you get a you book. Get a book. You, you get, get a, a book. book. Yeah. Well, somebody approached me and they said, you know, you've got a lot of interesting things going on. Would you be interested in writing a book? I never even thought about it, to be honest with you. Right. And I said, yeah, yeah, I might be in, interested. So the last year I've been writing a book. And were uh, you a big reader? I, I, I was, especially when I traveled, because okay. every time I traveled on a plane, I could read one book. I read mm. real fast. Um, so, uh, you know, I read all these books and such, and I thought, well, you know, how can I actually give back or contribute to society in some way? That's good. And I thought, you know, there's been something that I've struggled with that many of us struggle with our whole life, and that's a fear of failure. Absolutely. So I, I thought, well, maybe I could write about that, because... I think early in my life and early in most people's life, they're kind of motivated about fear of failing. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at Mike, Mike Tyson, Michael Jordan, a lot of these people they had this fear of failing, uh, but they, they, they got beyond it. And then right. one, one of the things that uh, I've discovered was rather than trying to hide people, people get this fear of failure and they don't do things because they're afraid of doing it. Right. Right. So they just quit before they even start. And I thought, well, you know, this Ironman triathlon experience was a real eye-opening thing to me about, hey, you actually can get through things That's and good. not be afraid of them, but just take it as it comes, step by step, be in the moment, worry about what's going on now, rather the enormity of things. Right. Especially in an Ironman triathlon, if you think at the starting line that, man, I'm going to be out here for 12, 13, 14 hours you probably might say, man, this isn't worth it, mm -hmm. you know, but when you deal with it in steps and one step at a time, one swim stroke at a time, you, you can actually get through things and, right. and be in the moment. But the same thing goes with your own personal life. You know, there are things that you think are just, you know, inconceivable. I can't do that. There was, there's a pole vaulter that said, uh, uh, life is, uh, I can't remember exactly what the saying was, but, uh, it's ordinary things people doing extraordinary things that's good and you can actually do more than you think you can do and that's right. what i discovered with the iron man triathlon i thought there was no way in hell i could ever finish an iron man triathlon mm. but the same goes with your personal life and business and and things like you know well you know I, i'm gonna redo my house right you know and and you, you got to get motivated to do that and you have to have the right mindset we were talking so, about this at lunch today, mm -hmm. man. Yeah. So that, that's kind of what yeah. the book is about. That's good. You know, it, it was actually centered more on business, but then I saw, man, there are so many personal examples with this that, uh, I, I think it could be a help to a lot of people. So that, that was my motivation for writing the book. And I, I got an editor working with me and such, and, uh, uh, it's taken a lot more time than I thought it would and right, right. a lot more effort, but, uh, but it's been a real experience and I'm, uh, I, I think we're going to roll out the book now in August. Oh, very so it'll good. Be do on we have Amazon. a, do we have a title for it yet? Yeah. It's uh, leap beyond your limits. Leap the... beyond your limits. And I just have to put in a plug for you. I, I hope that you're going to do a recorded version of this book. For people like me who don't like to sit <laughs> and I hope that you do the recording because I like your voice. I like your I like well, the way you, you talk. Thank you. You got that? Yes. <laughs> good. George Costanza. That's from good. St I love it. So I, I, love it. I can only do recorded versions. Yeah. Or the VCR That's version. Exactly right. That's right. <laughs> don't let some boring person do the recording. <laughs> That's right. That monotone doesn't work no, when you're driving. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, any big plans for, for Pillar? Yeah. In fact, uh, we, the company that I invested in and subsequently became the, one of the main owners of, uh, actually started in 1987. Mm. It's been around for years doing last mile deliveries. And um, I got involved in actually 2003 and became a partner. Unfortunately, both of my partners passed away. So, so here I am. Uh, but, uh, um, we got together with our senior team, myself and a couple of the other owners. And we said, Hey, what are we really trying to do here? The pandemic opened up our eyes of what a, a significant industry this is and could, could be with still a lot of potential. So we had a strategic planning meeting and what we decided to do was we decided to change our name. We're going to be summit delivery services 
but also we also defined exactly what we want to do. And this is a new update, right? Yeah, it yeah. is. And you know, it's funny. I graduated with an MBA in business uh, and uh, we should have done this years ago. Yeah. And I'm like, this is like basic business 101. What do you want your company to stand for? And what do you, what are you doing? Like, for instance, my, my company, we're not the low cost price leader. You know, right, we're in the right. middle there, but we provide high standards of service, which is very important to retailers. Uh, the, the top retailers uh, are, are really interested in that. So, you know, that's our niche. Our niche is not to go after the bottom feeders, mm. just deliver and toss it on your front doorstep. Our, our uh, niche is to get into your home, deliver it, make sure you're satisfied, hook everything up properly. Right. And, and you know, it's, it's more of a sophisticated type delivery. Is that that's why you went name. from pillar being like the, the underpinning to being the summit, the top? We, that's exactly true. Okay. And, I know, like it. I like it. We spent a lot of time talking yeah. about that too. And, and, you know, we had like 90 some different names and we narrowed it down to that. I love and, it. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's significant to a lot of people. Our logo Absolutely. says it all. That's good. And, uh, so, so, yeah, it's really exciting for us. So at the end of this month, along with my book, we're also rolling out our new company and our new image awesome. and such. Uh, the other the other thing that we did that was very significant was we didn't have a significant presence on LinkedIn. Mm. And everybody is now. So now we're, we're going to have a big marketing campaign on LinkedIn. Very good. And that's how we met, right? Through LinkedIn. It is. Yeah. It is. yeah. It very it good. Is. So, but that's become very significant for everybody. You bet. Used to be in our industry, it was a word of mouth type of thing. Now it's not, you know, and, and a company can come out of nowhere and have a LinkedIn presence and all of a sudden they're a big deal. Right. And we saw that and said, man, we're missing the boat on this. So, so we're changing. That. That's good. Pivot. Now I'm assuming that, you know, you guys are basically setting up relationships with these large retailers yes. and you become a delivery option when an item is, is purchased. Um, there's not a, a consumer wouldn't be able to like, Hey, I just bought a refrigerator. I need somebody to, to deliver this thing for me. Well, first. we could accept that. Uh, you know, we, we are, you uh, significant with the large retailers. And uh, here's the key is that you buy something, say, from Best Buy. Mm -hmm. uh, my truck comes and delivers it to your house. You don't even know who we are. Right. For all you know, we're Best Buy. Right. right. And that's right. what the retailers want. The retailers want to concentrate and focus on selling product, uh, but they want their brand still know. So uh, we, are a, we are an extension of their brand. And uh, to the consumer, it's invisible. That's good. And, uh, so, yeah. So most of the time you go through the retailer and uh, uh, they, they utilize us. Now, do you guys get like uh, uniforms from the retailers? and They want you to wear like we do the we Best do. Buy shirt when you do a Best Buy delivery. We do. They, they, that's their branding. Right. And some of our trucks even have their decals all over. Them, wow. You know, so. Uh, uh, so, yeah, there, there's some of that. But, you know, the problem with some of that, though, is there's a lot of regulations and a lot of legalities that um, uh, many of the retailers prefer not to have their names all over gotcha. our trucks. Right. You know, and there's a co-employment issue and uh, uh, things like that, that that they're concerned with. So uh, so we need to deal with that. Well, what advice would you give someone that's interested in getting into logistics as a, as a career? Well, that, that's interesting you brought that up because I actually did a podcast uh, with a company about how to do that. Mm. Um, we are, with the National Home Delivery Association, we have a two-pronged approach to trying to develop our industry. One of them is we started a leadership institute to bring up up-and-coming people, supervisors, and executives into our industry. This is in conjunction with High Point University where we have a program where they actually get a fellowship in leadership and how, how leadership specific to our industry. We're also starting a project where it's called the IC Accelerator Project, where we are teaching people how to become businessmen and how to get into this industry. Uh, before the industry developed its own by, you know, the brother-in-law or a relative or a right. friend and teaching someone else, uh, one of your friends, how to, how to be a last mile delivery person. Now we're becoming more, more and more sophisticated with that. And we hope by uh, next year to have this program rolled out where people can enroll 
somewhat like a trade school mm -hmm. in this type of industry, cool. you know, and you know what they need to do, what they need to do to succeed. Right, a lot of people right. get into it and they fail because they really don't know how, how to go about dealing with the, uh, the authority, trucking authorities, how to handle the merchandise, how to handle yourself and right. you know, not get hurt and things like that. So we are working uh, on that as an industry as well. Hmm. So get involved with, with the association, I guess. Is, Absolutely. What, how, how do they get a hold of the association? There's, we have a website called, it's a long one, National Home Delivery Association.com. <laughs> Someone else had the rights to NHDA.com, so, uh, so we couldn't buy that. But, uh, but you can go and look in that site there, or you can go to my company, PillarLogistics.com, and uh, uh, find out more about our industry as well. Very so, good. Soon to be I'm, Summit Delivery that's right. Services.com. <laughs> that was my next question. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> Well, Don, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. And, uh, Don. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I know, I know who to call if I have a problem with delivery now. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> I'd say so. Thank Man, you very much. I know. It's been a pleasure to be yeah. here. <laughs> I love it. Well, with that, we'll, we, we will see you guys next time. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode of Behind the Curtain, Nashville's Movers, Shakers. And taste makers. We hope you've been inspired by the stories of passion, perseverance, and innovation right here in Nashville. A big thank you to our guests for sharing their journeys and to you, our listeners, for joining us. And of course, our gratitude to Accord Real Estate for making this conversation possible. Don't forget to follow or subscribe to our podcast on did your I, favorite did I just platform. Thank us. Yes, you did. Oh, I guess I did. Well, thank us. Okay. Like I was saying. Oh, yeah. Don't forget to follow or subscribe on your favorite platform to catch every episode and hit that notification bell. We've got plenty more fascinating guests lined up, ready to share their insights and inspirations. And we love hearing from you. So reach out to us with your thoughts, questions, or suggestions for who you'd like to hear from next. Until next time, keep chasing your dreams and making your mark in Nashville. Oh my goodness. Remember, talking to Casey it's Kasem? the people behind the scenes that make the city shine. I love it. Take care. See you behind the curtain.